Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna be doing some abstract art, listening to lectures on how conversation works, six lessons for better communication. Right now we're on lecture three, how and when to be direct and indirect. And I may go into lecture four, how to navigate face threatening acts next. In the same video. So, here we go. How and when to be direct and indirect. We need to read between the lines a lot in conversations we have every day. Not that we can see the lines in spoken conversation, but we're still reading between them. Or, to be less metaphorical about the whole thing, we are constantly figuring out the meaning behind the actual words that people are saying. This ability is, in fact, key to making conversations work well. To be polite, people often aren't speaking directly. And it is our job as listeners not just to listen to the literal content, but also to figure out what other speakers really mean. If you step back and look at many conversations objectively, they can look like a lot of non sequiturs in a row. Let me show you what I mean. You say to me, my brother and his wife are gonna be in town on Friday night and they've been wanting to meet you. Will you come over for dinner? And I say, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm busy. You graciously reply, Oh, that's too bad. Maybe another time. All of that seems completely normal. And that's because it is completely normal. It also seems completely logical. But there was a big inferential jump in that conversation. You asked if I wanted to come over for dinner, if I would come over for dinner. I responded that I'm busy. You took my statement as a response to your invitation. You took my statement to mean, I am busy on Friday night in such a way that prohibits me from joining you and your brother and his wife for dinner. But I didn't actually say that directly. I said it indirectly. This lecture will focus on the logic of conversation and the way that we use direct speech and indirect speech, such as, I'm busy, rather than, no, I can't. Understanding more consciously how direct and indirect speech work gives you a key set of tools for accomplishing things through conversation, sometimes politely and sometimes very powerfully. It can also help you interpret what people are saying between the lines, or as linguists would put it, to interpret conversational implicature. I started with the example of, I'm sorry, I'm busy, as an indirect response to a request or an invitation, as opposed to me saying, no, I won't. You could have responded to my saying, I'm sorry, I'm busy, with, well, I'm sorry you're busy these days, but can you join us for dinner on Friday night? But that would be typically seen as quite rude. I'm busy is a very conventionalized way of saying that you can't do something. Or if you called me out on it that way, it would be funny. You would do it because you know me well, because what you're doing is suddenly highlighting the leap that we've made when I say I'm busy as a way to say I'm busy on Friday night and I can't come. You highlighted that indirect speech act. Let me give you another example of a common indirect speech act. This one less conventionalized. Let's imagine that a friend and I are at the farmer's market, and I have just picked out the flowers I want, along with some strawberries and tomatoes. I pull out my wallet, open it, and I exclaim, ah, I forgot to go to the ATM. My friend says, don't worry about it, I can lend you $20. This probably, again, seems very logical, but there were jumps here too. I said, I forgot to go to the ATM. This is a statement of fact. But my friend interpreted it as a request for a loan. So how did that happen? Well, my friend worked through the implications of my utterance. 
for me to have made this statement, it must be relevant to the current situation, which is that I'm trying to buy flowers, strawberries, and tomatoes. This requires cash. So my statement must be relevant to my possession of the cash that I need. My friend, therefore, reads my statement as, I forgot to go to the ATM and get cash, which means that I do not have enough cash to buy these lovely flowers, strawberries, and tomatoes. Can you loan me some cash? Now, that last request may or may not be implied in my statement, but my friend read it that way and offered me the loan. My friend could also have replied, oh, there's an ATM right around the corner. There's again some inferential work there because my friend has to assume that my statement indicates that I don't have enough cash and therefore I might need to go to an ATM around the corner to get cash. You may be thinking right now that we can't really be doing all this work all the time just to understand the logic of a quite quotidian conversation at the farmer's market. But in fact, we are. At this point, I've now mentioned a couple of times an indirect speech act. And I want to address that term, speech act, and then talk about ways to use direct and indirect speech acts effectively in different contexts. We get things done by talking. Sometimes we can think that we use language or talk just to describe the world our thoughts, our feelings, that kind of thing. But philosopher J.L. Austin pointed out that in fact, we use speech to do things, not just to talk about things. He called this the speech act, to suggest that we are acting or performing actions when we talk. What do I mean by this? Well, let's consider a speech act, like my saying to you, I bet you $10 that it will snow in April which I have to say is a frighteningly safe bet in Ann Arbor, Michigan. As soon as I say this, the world is a different place. I now have $10 on the line based on a weather occurrence. I didn't just describe something, I did something. Here are some other examples of quite obvious speech acts. I say, I promise not to tell anyone about your playing hooky from work this afternoon. The world is now a different place, I've made a promise. Or, for example, I pronounce you husband and wife. Now, of course, for this to actually change the world, I would have to be authorized for, to do this, which I may or may not be. Another example, in a baseball game, a first base umpire yells, you're out, and now that runner is out. So all these utterances do work in the world, and all of them state pretty directly the work that they are doing, promising or pronouncing. The philosopher John Searle at the University of California at Berkeley clarified another useful distinction about speech acts. And you'll notice here that some of the foundational work on speech acts came out of work in philosophy about the relationship of language and meaning. Searle noted that each speech act has three forces, locutionary force, illocutionary force, and perlocutionary force. These concepts turn out to be very helpful in terms of understanding how conversations work. So let me explain the three and give you an example of each. The locutionary force is what we literally say. The illocutionary force is what is implied in what we say. And the perlocutionary force is what happens as a result of what we say. Let's look at an example. I say, I would really like a Diet Coke right now. The locutionary force of this utterance is a statement of fact about what I would really like. Now the illocutionary force is probably different. This is probably a request of some kind for someone to get me a Diet Coke or for someone to tell me where I can get a Diet Coke. The perlocutionary force is that somebody would produce a Diet Coke from the fridge for me, or perhaps say, there's a vending machine downstairs. And these three forces help us understand direct and indirect speech. Direct speech acts are speech acts where the literal meaning, the locutionary force, aligns with the implied meaning, or the illocutionary force. So for example, I say, I promise not to tell anyone 
about your playing hooky from work this afternoon. That is a direct speech act. Or I say, tell me what time it is. And I have to say, it's hard for me to imagine a context in which I would say, tell me what time it is. It feels fairly rude. Part of that is that the imperative, that tell me, is one of the strongest forms that we can use in that kind of direct speech act. I could ask, still using a direct speech act, what time is it? And that feels more polite and even more polite if I start with something like, excuse me, what time is it? It's a direct question, but not a direct imperative. And often, if I'm asking about the time, I'll do it indirectly, even though this is hardly an imposition on you to have to tell me the time. Indirect speech acts are speech acts where the literal meaning, the locutionary force, does not align with the implied meaning or the illocutionary force. With the time example, it would be an indirect speech act would be something like, do you know what time it is? Or, I was wondering if you knew the time. Or, could you tell me what time it is? These may feel to you like direct requests for the time, but let's look at the locutionary force of those utterances. Do you know what time it is? This is literally a yes, no question about your knowledge. And you could say, yes, I do, and then not tell me the time. If we think about, I was wondering if you knew the time. This is literally just a statement about my mental state of wondering. And if you wanted to be a little obnoxious about it, you could just say, huh, how interesting that you were wondering that. Or the third example, could you tell me what time it is? Literally, that's a question about possibility. You could respond, I could tell you what time it is. But being the cooperative speaker that you are, you would probably not respond to the locutionary force, but you would respond to the illocutionary force, which is my request for the time and you would just tell me what time it is. So an important point here is to remember that there are many ways to say the same thing. As you can probably already sense, indirect speech is an important part of politeness. So when might we use direct speech versus indirect speech? Direct speech can feel very powerful to us in many Western cultures at least in part because it is defying many politeness conventions. If I say, tell me what you think, it assumes that I have the power to tell you what to do. It assumes a situation in which the power dynamics are such that this would not strike either of us as odd or out of place, that I'm framing this as a command rather than a request. If I were going to do this indirectly, I would say something like, what are you thinking about this? Or, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So there we see a direct question feels more polite and then the indirect, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Let's imagine that you're chairing a meeting. This is a moment when you are expected to take control and at least some of the time, tell folks what's gonna happen and what you need them to do. Let's start by looking at a couple of different ways that you could bring the meeting to order and there are potentially different effects. If you were gonna do this indirectly, you could say something like, could we please bring this meeting to order? Or, I'm hoping we can get started now. You'll notice that with these indirect speech acts, you seem to be asking permission, which is polite, but may not be read as very powerful. If you did this more directly, you could say something like, I'm calling this meeting to order. Or, it's 10 o'clock, I'm going to get us started. These are subtle differences, but they can be important. It sends a signal of whether or not you feel authorized to start the meeting. And in this case, it seems very unlikely that the direct speech acts will seem rude. So one certainly can use direct speech and should use direct speech when appropriate. And the act itself can reinforce your authority as chair. Then, in the meeting, a chair can use direct and indirect speech acts to navigate relationships. A direct speech act in most Western cultures will feel more authoritative, and an indirect speech act will feel more collaborative. There are reasons in different meetings to do both of these and to make different kinds of requests. Let's imagine
imagine, for example, that you're chair and you're turning the floor over to someone else as part of the agenda. You could do this using direct speech acts. You could say something like, I'm going to turn the floor over to Samantha. Samantha, will you please tell people about your subcommittee study? Or again, a direct speech act, this time with an imperative. Samantha, please fill us in on your subcommittee study. You'll note the tone difference there between the first one, which was a question, and the second one, which was an imperative. Then you could do the same thing using an indirect speech act. You could say something like, Samantha, could you tell us about your subcommittee's report? There probably isn't a need for a chair to frame this as an indirect request, but it might make Samantha feel more like a partner than a subordinate, which could be useful in some situations. At other moments, you as the person in authority, as the chair, will want to decide just how much you want to make a request seem like a request, as opposed to an assignment. Let's imagine that you as chair are wrapping up the meeting and setting out the agenda from here. You could do this using direct speech acts. For example, you could say, Jose, I'm asking you to follow up with the company to determine whether they are okay with this option. Samantha. Please revise your report to reflect the feedback that you got here today, and then give it to Cheryl to review before it comes to my desk for a final review. Again, probably nothing here is going to seem rude, assuming that these folks are paid, they work for you, or they otherwise expect to follow through on your requests. You, as chair, seem to be focused on delegation and efficiency, and you are giving direct commands. But you will notice that you are using please on occasion, which seems quite polite. Let's compare this with the same set of directions done as indirect requests, which might be more appropriate, for example, in a meeting with volunteers. So here's the same speech act indirectly. Jose, could you follow up with the company to determine whether they're okay with this option? And Samantha, I'm hoping you can revise your report to reflect the feedback that you got here today. Then Cheryl, would you be willing to review it before it comes to my desk for a final review? This now includes a couple of questions, which suggests that you as chair need people to voluntarily agree, that you are not taking their agreement for granted, which can feel very collaborative. And that, I'm hoping, will sound less authoritative than I'm asking. It may also strike some as less efficient in terms of a set of directions, but it will feel more collaborative. There's not a right or wrong here, as there are many different kinds of meetings in the world. The chair may or may not be in a higher position than other people in the meeting room, and the strategies that the chair chooses will reflect that. And as I said in an earlier lecture, people also respond differently to men and women making direct commands, that there can be different responses in terms of the kind of politeness conventions that people may expect from men and women. But it is important to realize that the different speech acts we choose can send different messages. Now we can all imagine situations where we want to use especially powerful direct speech acts. If you're a parent, you can probably think of a few of these. And one of the most authoritative things we can do is foreground the speech act itself. For example, if as a parent you say, I'm telling you that you cannot have more than one friend in the car when you're driving. That is a very authoritative speech act. Or there are moments in a meeting where we may want to redirect people to the central speech act. They've gone off somewhere else and we want to bring them back. So we could say something like, I hear what you're saying about that computer glitch but I'm asking you about the human decisions. By doing this, by using this, I'm asking you, we bring that direct speech act into focus, stressing the importance of that question. Then there are all the times that we use indirect speech in our daily lives. Indirect speech typically feels more polite, and politeness is an important part of navigating the social world. And I do want to note here that, of course, politeness conventions vary by culture, as we'll be talking a bit about. Now that you're aware of indirect speech acts, you will probably be struck by how often you use indirect speech acts every day to make requests. You're sitting at breakfast and you say, 
can you reach the sugar? Which is an indirect request to get the sugar. You stop your neighbor and say, do you know if the condo association meeting is still on Thursday? Your friend calls and asks you, could you remind me of the name of that great restaurant we ate at? All of those are indirect. Now, one very good time to use indirect speech is when we're asking something of someone who's in a more powerful position than we are. Consider this scenario. I'm teaching and I've just reviewed a chart in class and the student remains very confused. This student has a couple of options if he wants to be to repeat myself. He raises his hand and he says, Professor Kurzan, please go over the chart again. Now this is definitely possible, but I think it might strike many of us as a little odd for him to use such a direct speech act, even with the please, given our relationship as professor and student. It's more likely that he will go with something like, Professor Kurzan, would you mind going over the chart again? We probably all recognize that this more indirect request is more polite and seems to recognize the potential imposition of asking me to review. We'll talk more about how to impose on people in the next lecture. That student's indirect request also acknowledges the power differential by using an indirect question rather than a command. But sometimes it's effective to use indirect speech checks even when technically you're requesting something that someone should do as part of their job. Think about this, you're at the grocery store standing in front of the deli and you say, could I get a pound of sliced turkey? In theory, it's the person's job to give you a pound of sliced turkey, but you're asking indirectly, politely. You're at dinner at a restaurant and you say, could I get some coffee? Again, you've made this request indirectly. You'll notice that in these instances, we're actually being making a more polite request than perhaps we need to for someone whose job it is to take a directive, to take our order. And this is how to be a polite customer. When we do this, we're minimizing the hierarchy inherent in the transaction at the grocery store or in the restaurant. So indirect speech is highly linked to politeness. And in some instances, indirect speech can be a way to negotiate differentials in power among people in a conversation. But I want to note that indirect speech can sometimes be pretty powerful. It can be as powerful as direct speech. Let's imagine that I want to meet with you right now, even though I don't have an appointment. I could do this directly. I'm asking to meet with you for a few minutes. Or, will you meet with me for a few minutes? I could do it indirectly, as a polite request. Could I meet with you briefly? Or, do you have a few minutes? But then consider this indirect speech act. I say, I need to talk to you for a few minutes. This is indirect, in that literally it's a statement of desire. I need, or what I need, not a request meeting, but it is as forceful a speech act as a direct speech act because it implies that my need is very important and should result in a meeting in me getting a few minutes of your time. As you can see, there are a lot of subtleties to how we choose to say what we want to say. And most of the time, we don't notice all these strategic things happening. Almost all of this is happening below the level of conscious awareness. But every once in a while, someone disrupts this understood logic of conversation or chooses to interpret an indirect speech act as direct. Now, why would they do that? As I mentioned earlier, interpreting an indirect speech act as direct can be funny. So, I ask you, do you know what time it is? And you say, well, yes, I do. And then we both laugh, because in fact, you knew exactly what I was asking, but you have refused my indirect speech act. But then occasionally, someone will also use it to highlight for someone else that they are making a request, even though it is indirect. So let's imagine this situation. Seated at the breakfast table, the wife says to the husband, do we have any milk? And the husband says, 
Yes, we do. Are you asking me to get it for you? Which is a way of the husband highlighting for the wife that she has made an indirect request, saying, do we have any milk? And highlighting for her that she's using this as a way to ask him to get up, as opposed to her getting up. This is disruptive, as it highlights the speech act itself. And I have to say, you want to use this power with care, because when you alert people to the speech act itself, it is disconcerting for them. So there can be times to do it, but be careful. Sometimes people also will defy the logic of conversation so seriously that no amount of inferential work that you do can seem to make sense of it. The true non sequitur, though, can actually do some helpful conversational work. And let me explain what I mean. You can use the true non sequitur very strategically to indicate, for instance, that we, the speakers in this conversation, really need to change topics. So, for example, let's imagine that you're in a conversation where someone starts to gossip about someone else at work, and you do not think that this is appropriate, that you do not want to go here with this gossip. You could be direct and say, I don't think we should talk about this. But I think all of us know that that can feel like a hard speech act, that you're telling people this isn't appropriate and I don't think we should do this. There's another more subtle way to do it. You could use the non sequitur to do the work. You could say, so have any of you seen the new Harry Potter movie? You can then laugh together at your conversation move, but the signal will have been sent indirectly, but clearly that this topic needs to be abandoned and a new topic needs to be introduced may not be the new Harry Potter movie, but the message will be sent. You can make a similar move if someone asks you a personal question that you don't want to answer or says something, let's say, borderline offensive, and you want to shift the conversational territory without making a big deal out of it. You're counting on your listener to interpret the conversational logic of your throwing in a true non sequitur. So if you're in a conversation, that takes a turn that you're uncomfortable with, you can say directly, let's not go there. But you can make the same move by conversationally not going there, and very obviously taking the conversation somewhere else. And that example leads us to the topic that we'll be focused in the next lecture, how we negotiate situations where we're concerned about insulting others or imposing on others, as well as some situations where we should be concerned, such as giving people helpful advice. How can we successfully navigate these tricky situations where we're worried that others might lose face or that we might lose face? The easy answer is be polite, but we'll talk about much more specific strategies for how to do that well, as well as how to apologize if you don't do it well.